we're afraid we cannot uh, accommodate questions, but Dr. Arlene Gomez will stay online. And please feel free to type in your question in Q&A and she'll try her best to answer them while we continue with our um, webinar. So for this evening, it's quite a privilege to have uh, our speaker who uh, finished his internal medicine and nephrology training at the University of Calgary. He then completed his Master in Clinical Epidemiology and a Research Fellowship in Lupus and Vasculitis at the University of Cambridge, followed by a second fellowship and a PhD in Health Research Methodology at McMaster University. With this kind of education, it is no wonder that he now serves as an assistant professor of medicine, especially in nephrology and clinical epidemiology and biostatistics. His research interests are in systemic autoimmune diseases, particularly AMCA-associated vasculitis, chronic kidney disease, and end-stage renal disease, with a focus on prospective studies and clinical trials to evaluate risk markers, understand pathophysiology, and develop effective treatment strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Michael Walsh. Doctor? Hello, thank you for that kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, and you can start sharing your slides now. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, I wish I could have been there in person uh, and was very sad to have to cancel this trip. And I was asked to talk about perioperative acute kidney injury. Um, it's always difficult actually to give this talk to nephrologists because we're often involved in um, perioperative events after they've already started to unfold. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this from the perspective of the epidemiology and natural history of acute kidney injury after surgery, predicting the risk of acute kidney injury, potentially preventing it, and then its early detection and a treatment of it once it is detected. So I'll throw in a few slides about Canada here, just for um, comparison. Canada is almost 10 million square kilometers, but we only have 37 million people. But it's not as sparsely populated as you might think because about 85% of Canada is almost uninhabited. So we all collect in a few small regions. So the epidemiology and natural history of periop AKI. So I'm going to talk generally about AKI uh, using the KDIGO criteria for serum creatinine as the uh, definition, but I'll try and differentiate uh, during the talk when we so speak specifically around dialysis requiring AKI, because it's a slightly different and more meaningful entity than rises in germ creatinine. The etiology, I think, is always just important to remember, particularly when we're thinking about prevention and treatment strategies. By and large, perioperative AKI is considered an ischemia reperfusion injury, whether it's pre-renal in nature or whether or not it extends to tubular necrosis. Occasionally, we have other etiologies, rhabdomyolysis, medication-induced, and other things like acute interstitial nephritis are still important to remember, particularly with proton pump inhibitors uh, being one of the most common classes of medications causing uh, interstitial nephritis now in hospitalized patients. And of course, other simple things like obstruction and um, uh, NSAIDs as potential etiologies or exacerbating factors. So when we talk about what happens in terms of how often this occurs, the estimates actually can vary dramatically based on both what the definition of AKI is and what the setting is. This is just a uh, smattering of relatively recent studies looking at the incidence of acute kidney injury after various types of surgery by various definitions. And you can see it ranges anywhere from three up to almost 30%, uh, depending on the types of surgeries. That's um, not very surprising. Obviously, some of these are very high-risk procedures undergone in, in patients um, who have very poor kidney function to begin with. Others are relatively low-risk uh, procedures and are typically done in healthier patients as well. 
When we took a look at what happened to dialysis requiring acute kidney injury in the province of Ontario uh, here in Canada, we wanted to understand what happened over time in particular. In fact, the incidence of dialysis requiring AKI increased about threefold across all surgical types in the period between 1995 and 2009. That's most obvious in cardiac surgery and vascular surgery, um, where the baseline risk or the starting risk is the highest, and perhaps easily explainable by the fact that the uh, patients who were once relatively straightforward cases for cabbage are now much more difficult cases that have been rejected from PCI and are undergoing aortic um, and valvular uh, procedures at the same time as their, uh, their cabbage. But it's actually also true of other surgical types. Uh, that have increased from about 0.1% per 100 uh, surgical patients up to now about 0.3%. Importantly uh, is what happens to patients after they require acute dialysis following surgery. It's uh, true that across those surgeries, if you require dialysis, the rate of death is about 42% consistently across the entire time period. So that really hasn't changed, indicating that the severity of the disease is very consistent, even though the types of patients that are undergoing surgery uh, maybe have differed dramatically over that 15 year period. Similarly, the percentage of patients who continue to require dialysis after discharge remains fairly constant at around 27% of all survivors of the hospitalization. So those are fairly bad outcomes for people who have required dialysis after surgery, with almost half dying, and of those who survive, a quarter requiring permanent dialysis. If we look a lot at uh, less serious acute kidney injury, obviously it's much more common. This is um, a graph showing in the bars the proportion of patients who develop various types of kidney injury amongst an elderly cohort of about 20,000 Australians undergoing surgery. And you can see almost 10% had some rise in creatinine and another 10% almost had at least a doubling or more uh, of their creatinine. If you take a look also then at the line that is over top of the bars, it shows that the mortality rate uh, for these elderly individuals who have serious kidney injury, so a, a threefold rise in serum creatinine, is still about 50%, so very close to that of those who require dialysis in our own cohort, suggesting that some patients will still have very bad outcomes um, even if they uh, do not require dialysis but that obviously it's a graded risk across the uh, severity of acute kidney injury. And if we look at, this is now a very old slide of the early meta-analyses that showed that AKI, regardless of what setting it was seen in, had fairly consistent estimates of how severe it was actually going to be at around a doubling for, of uh, the risk of death for very mild injuries, moderate injuries around four times, and severe injuries overall about six times, although those ranged from anywhere from about four times up to about 22 times the risk of death, depending on the cohorts that were studied. Of course, death is not the only thing that we're interested in. And in fact, if we think about it as a much more direct complication of AKI, it's a sustained reduction in GFR. And about 45% of patients in one large study of the uh, Veterans Affairs Again, the United States demonstrated that patients came away from their acute kidney injuries with a sustained reduction in GFR, at least 10% lower than it had been prior to their hospitalization. And if we take a look at the risk of developing new chronic kidney disease in those who didn't have it prior to de developing AKI, um, the more severe the, the AKI episode, the more likely you are to have a CKD following uh, that uh, episode. Uh, so anywhere from a doubling for very mild up to almost 28 times for those who require had very severe uh, injuries. And again, that's not overly surprising, um, particularly those who did not have kidney injury or kidney disease coming into their acute kidney injury. They had to have fairly severe uh, kidney problems or uh, health problems in order to develop these severe kidney injuries. And that translates into a risk for end-stage kidney disease as well. So how can we predict those that are likely to develop acute kidney injury? 
Well, in cardiac surgery, there's actually several models. I've listed out the two that are probably the most referenced and the most used, uh, which is the Cleveland Clinic model, uh, which is commonly referred to as the Thacker model, and the uh, STS model, also commonly referred to as the Meta model. Um, they both predict dialysis requirement after cardiac surgery. They uh, both include uh, valvular procedures as well as uh, straightforward cabbage. Um, and they're both based off of US populations, but they've both undergone un uh, external validation in various other populations. Uh, the calibration, so how well they actually predict that someone is likely to require dialysis after surgery has been fairly variable in different cohorts. And so you may end up with slightly different answers between the two and the degree to which they're actually applicable uh, to your patients may be somewhat in question. It should also be noted that the uh, STS model has been updated in 2009 and uh, the 10 variable model is a, is a relatively simplified model. They have a now large STS calculator that uh, looks at uh, about a dozen different outcomes after cardiac surgery of which the requirement of dialysis is one, uh, but it uses a large number of variables. These are all easily accessible online. They have online calculators. Um, and they do help uh, gauge what the overall risk of a very serious kidney injury is after dial or after a cardiac surgery. Now, cardiac surgery is relatively uncommon compared to non-cardiac surgery. Uh, in our hospital, we have about 10 times the volume of non-cardiac surgery each day that we do uh, cardiac and vascular procedures. And unfortunately, non-cardiac surgery, despite being more common, is not quite as well studied in terms of risk prediction. Um, this is one of the more recent publications done in 2019 by a Korean group uh, that looked at an instrument that they end up calling SPARC. Um, it's a calculator that they derived from 50,000 Korean patients and validated on about 40,000 more patients all in Korea. Um, the major risk factors, if you look at the number of points that are assigned on the right-hand side, are largely attributed to uh, worse CKD uh, at the time of surgery, older age, and emergency surgery. And in fact, if we look at most surgical complications, um, at least older age and emergency surgery also show up for most, uh, uh, for most of their issues. So those aren't too surprising. And Chronic kidney disease or low EGFR going into essentially any illness or any procedure is uh, the strongest risk factor for developing acute kidney injury. Now, theirs is, um, although they can assign a lot of different points, they basically group all of these into <laughs> four categories and uh, they give a fairly rough estimate of the, uh, of the degree of risk for relatively minor chronic kidney disease afterwards, so only stage two um, uh, kidoki or sorry, Kidago. Um, there are a bunch of other more specific calculators. Some of them have undergone um, other external validation. Uh, they include uh, calculators for abdominal surgery, orthopedic surgery, uh, liver resection, and uh, lung transplant. Uh, but none of them are uh, particularly broad, well-validated uh, models. So in many ways, this limits some um, what we can do in order to help patients frame decision-making for elective surgeries. But the overall risk is still so low at around 0.1 to 0.2% um, for most surgery types that it tends to be uh, irrelevant. And the patients who are most likely to require dialysis are those that nephrologists already know quite well because they tend to have the worst kidney function heading into dialysis. One of the things though that is lacking is that for those patients who are high risk, uh, having preoperative risk uh, prediction may help with monitoring plans. And I think as we move through this talk, we'll make a bit of an argument that monitoring is perhaps one of the most important things that we can actually do in mitigating the, uh, the issues with the acute kidney injury after surgery. Certainly right now in the work that uh, we've done, the measurement of serum creatinine after non-cardiac surgery is extremely heterogeneous both uh, between and even within centers where um, it can be anywhere from 40 percent of all patients receive at least one serum creatinine measurement after surgery in some centers and 90 percent in others despite the fact that the case mixes are very similar. So this is just uh, where I come from. This is actually central Alberta not uh, where I live now and uh, if you notice anything it's flat as can be 
uh, you can see for about 400 kilometers in one direction. But if you turn around, you see this on the other side. And uh, I lo no longer live there, but uh, this was the sort of crowning crown jewel of the uh, central prairies. Okay, so we know that when AKI happens, it is um, a herald of other bad things occurring and that we have some degree of predicting it, although it isn't great for most surgeries. So can we prevent it? Well, there's several strategies I won't talk about that have been tested numerous times and have essentially failed each time. Uh, that would include NaCl cysteine, uh, sodium bicarbonate, and um, both low and moderate dose atrial natriuretic peptides. So instead what I'll do is I'll go through a few different uh, options that seem promising. So one thing that occurs very routinely is a choice of the type of anesthetic um, going into surgery. And there's been a lot of interest in the potential properties of volatile anesthetics to protect against various ischemic reperfusion injuries. Um, that includes looking at uh, acute kidney injury, although much of this argument actually started with cardiac protection. And there is a larger number of information um, to be able to discuss what exactly happens with cardiac injury and volatile anesthetic preconditioning or, or use during surgery, uh, where it's quite strong. But even in AKI, uh, there is uh, some evidence to suggest that there is a reduction in the risk of AKI for those patients who are um, uh, induced with desflurane or sevoflurane uh, as volatile anesthetics compared to non-volatile anesthetics and particularly IV uh, anesthesia. So these, um, this is based off of 100 events in almost 1,000 patients, but the, uh, the the reason that this probably doesn't make it into um, our sort of usual news circles very often is that in many countries, volatile anesthetic is used as part of the anesthetic mix routinely already. And so it actually doesn't make a lot of difference to many anesthesiologists whether or not they're using desflurane or sevoflurane primarily uh, or for the entire duration uh, or only part of the duration of the OR. I should also mention that although there is reasonable evidence to suggest that there is also some effect on cardiac protection, none of that seems to have translated into effects in terms of length of stay, of hospitalization after surgery, or morbidity or other serious, uh, sorry, or mortality or other serious morbidities. So there is this discrepancy between some of the biomarkers, these blood-based biomarkers of um, cardiac injury and renal injury seeming to be improved, but it may be dissociated from the actual clinical picture of the patients. I thought I should just quickly mention nitric oxide. Um, so the effects of nitric oxide on acute kidney injury are not actually all that uh, well established. Um, the largest study looking at nitric oxide was the ENIGMA-2 trial um, of patients undergoing non-cardiac uh, surgery. Uh, over 7,000 patients, and there was really no effect on death or cardiovascular complications. There was a slight increased risk of renal failure, and that was really a very severe renal failure, uh, but it was only based on 16 events, and so the, the, whether or not that's true or just a chance finding is very uncertain, and in fact, it didn't even rate a, uh, a mention in the paper. The risk of nausea and vomiting were higher in, in, with nitric oxide, and that may have been one of the reasons why creatinine was a bit higher. Uh, but whether or not it was important is, uh, is uncertain, and it probably wasn't given that um, death and cardiovascular complications were so similar. And certainly in a meta-analysis of randomized trials done before Enigma uh, 2 was released, there was uh, no evidence of um, uh, increased risk of AKI uh, for cardiac surgery. So if we change gears slightly from um, anesthetic preconditioning and nitric oxide to ischemic preconditioning. Ischemic preconditioning is um, a phenomenon where you create an uh, area of ischemia, sublethal ischemia in a tissue bed, and then you re um, allow reperfusion to that same tissue bed. The idea is, is that during a period when tissue is hypoxic, but not lethally so, it will release various factors, um, of which there's been about 50 postulated, uh, that end up pro providing protective effects over the rest of the, uh, the tissues in the body through circulation. 
And there are a number of really elegant and uh, compelling experiments in animals um, suggesting that you can make a limb ischemic and protect the heart, the kidneys, uh, the lungs, the skin, and uh, the liver uh, through this mechanism. Um, it had been used sort of periodically as direct conditioning of the, the heart during uh, coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, where they would clamp and release coronary arteries uh, for many years and still done in many places. And then it kind of progressed to trying to tourniquet limbs periodically prior to surgery. This has now been done uh, in a large number of trials. So overall, about 6,000 patients randomized. The main effect, the place where there was the um, best evidence from the previous literature uh, was in cardiovascular protection. And there, there really was not evidence of benefit. Um, so although, again, the markers of cardiac injury like uh, CK and troponin uh, seem to be improved, when it came to myocardial infarctions, um, cardiac arrest, and other major cardiovascular events, there was no evidence of protection. Interestingly, acute kidney injury does still come out with a signal when it is lumped as all definitions of acute kidney injury, including undefined uh, in clinical trials off of a large number of events, uh, 15, or sorry, um, 1,400 events over almost 8,000 patients included. Um, and unfortunately, that signal kind of degrades when you take a look at uh, more specific definitions. Now, normally what we would expect is we would expect the effect to get stronger as we go to more serious um, uh, levels of AKI, but we would expect the confidence intervals to get wider. In fact, what we see in, in the cumulative data so far is that in fact, the effect is weaker as the more at the more serious AKI levels. The, uh, the confidence intervals are wider just because there's fewer events, but it is uh, a little bit counterintuitive as to why that would have happened. And it's eroded some of our, our um, uh, trust that that was a true effect that was seen in the all definitions AKI. It also, it just doesn't seem quite consistent with the lack of cardiac benefit. And so I think that's another reason why this has not really caught on as a, a major protective strategy for the kidneys. So then the third sort of um, area that I'd like to talk about is uh, hemodynamics and uh, fluids. Uh, so. I, when I spoke at the beginning, I said that uh, the vast majority of acute kidney injury is likely due to ischemic reperfusion injury. And so, of course, our major goal then in trying to prevent ischemic reperfusion injury is to prevent the ischemia component. In uh, abdominal surgery in particular, there had been a longstanding belief that by restricting fluids, um, you would encourage better healing of the abdominal wound. And so there had been a movement towards uh, increasingly strict uh, uh, restrictions of IV fluids during and after abdominal surgery. The relief trial randomized 3,000 patients to either a liberal strategy, which was a fixed weight-based strategy that was maintained for 24 hours, um, unless there was volume overload or serious hypotension requiring additional fluids, or to a restricted strategy, which started patients off with a much reduced bolus during induction, and then uh, was targeting a net zero fluid balance over the next 24 hours. That actually resulted in about a 2.4 liter difference in the IV fluid administration between the two groups um, over 24 hours. And interestingly, it resulted in no difference in the primary outcome of uh, major surgical complications or death. Um, there was perhaps a slight difference that went against what was the common wisdom of the time that a restrictive strategy uh, should have reduced surgical site infections. In fact, they were slight, slightly increased. Uh, but it also largely increased the risk of acute kidney injury. And that was actually one of the major findings that there was a 1.7 fold increase in the risk of acute kidney injury and that there was a commensurate increase in dialysis. Again, dialysis was uncommon um, mm -hmm. even in this major abdominal surgery. But uh, it was uh, three times more common in those who were, uh, underwent the restrictive strategy. Uh, pulmonary edema, which we sometimes worry in the more liberal strategy, will be more common. It was uh, barely uh, more common um, and not statistically significantly so. I think the, the message really from this trial was that 
you know, not necessarily that we should give a lot of volume, um, but that we certainly shouldn't um, allow our patients to become hypovolemic or dehydrated. So what if we look at more sophisticated ways of doing this, rather than just giving fixed doses of fluids, if we look at goal-directed kind of care? Um, obviously, the vast majority of the, uh, the literature in this comes from the sepsis field, uh, but there is um, intraoperative goal-directed fluid uh, trials as well. And in fact, there's quite a few of them now. Um, they can be all sorts of different types of ways of doing goal-directed care, um, and they can employ either the use of fluids or vasopressors to reach either cardiac output or oxygen delivery targets, uh, preload indices, or uh, things like ensuring that lactate doesn't rise or is reduced over time. Um, the, if we take a look at all of these types of trials then, there's at least 65 of those up until 2019 that include almost 10,000 patients now. Um, and again, they are quite heterogeneous in both the intervention and the, uh, the types of patients that they study. But overall, the odds ratio for developing any kind of AKI was uh, 0.74 uh, with a confidence interval that spans 0.62 to 0.87. So reasonable uh, suggestion that this actually avoids a rise in creatinine. Now, I think there is still, um, uh, you have to ask the question as to whether or not that rise in creatinine is really important or not, or whether or not it just escapes a, a biochemical effect, uh, but it certainly seems to be there. And that was regardless of what type of monitoring or what types of um, resuscitation strategies were actually used, whether it was fluids alone or fluids and pressors. Uh, the authors of the paper made a bit of a, a big deal about this being most relevant for cardiac output and oxygen delivery targets, uh, but in fact, the results are almost dead consistent uh, within the, the, the levels of expected error across all of the different uh, ways of providing goal-directed therapy. So I, I'm going to now just talk quickly about off-pump coronary surgery. Um, it's obviously something that's not really in the control of anyone but the surgeon in terms of uh, a way of reducing uh, the probability of acute kidney injury. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, off-pump surgery is where the uh, coronary artery bypass is done on a still beating heart that has just a, a regional stabilization of the myocardium in the area that the surgeon is working on rather than the patient having to go on complete cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, have the entire heart um, in uh, cardioplegia. Uh, there's actually several trials now that have been done of this. Uh, uh, and leading up until 2010, they were meta-analyzed for their effects on acute kidney injury with the idea that cardiopulmonary bypass is inherently toxic to the, the kidneys, either because of its lack of pulsatile flow or the inflammatory cascade uh, or the relatively low perfusion pressures that it um, can provide. And that meta-analysis suggested that there was a fairly large risk reduction in the um, outcome of AKI. Again, this was uh, defined as any definition of AKI, but that was really only based on 59 events. And most of the definitions uh, were dialysis-based. So we had the opportunity to look at this in a much larger trial. Uh, so we conducted a trial of, uh, of almost 4,500 patients that were randomized to off-pump versus on-pump coronary artery bypass grafting um, internationally. And of those, we enrolled almost 3,000 into a renal sub-study where we measured their creatinine serially after surgery and again, uh, serially at uh, one year. And our hypothesis was, was that we were fairly confident that um, cabbage off pump would reduce the risk of acute uh, kidney injury. But we wanted to know that if that reduction in acute kidney injury would translate to improved kidney function at one year. Uh, and if so, it would suggest that uh, reducing uh, these bumps in creatinine early on after surgery may translate into more important effects for patients down the road. It did have the expected effect on acute kidney injury, although the relative risk reduction was a little bit smaller than we were uh, expecting, but it was about a 16% relative risk reduction in acute kidney injury that was statistically significant. And in fact, that was the only short-term benefit to off-pump bypass. But in terms of chronic kidney disease at one year then, there was actually a slight increase in the risk of chronic kidney disease in the off-pump group compared to the on-pump group. 
disproving the hypothesis that the prevention of acute kidney injury resulted in what we thought would be a clinically important difference in longer term kidney outcomes. Um, and there's several reasons why this might have occurred. Uh, it, could have, it could be because patients um, who have off-pump surgery are more likely to have graft closures over the first year. They may therefore end up with slightly worse heart failure, be on a bit more ACE inhibition, have slightly lower perfusion pressures, all sorts of ways we can rationalize it. But I think what is really important about this study is, is that it forces us to remember that just because we're able to avoid stage two or stage three AKI does not mean that we will necessarily avoid other bigger complications um, that are more important to patients, such as the requirement for dialysis or the long-term risk of chronic kidney disease. So the last pictures I showed you were from the province of Alberta where I grew up. Uh, this is where I live now, which is uh, in Hamilton, and uh, it's also known as the city of waterfalls. Uh, but it's mostly known by that name by people who really like Hamilton. A lot of the rest of Canada thinks of it about this because uh, its major industry is, uh, is production and uh, most of our shoreline against Lake Ontario has been dominated by steel mills. Fortunately, I live facing the waterfall part and not the steel mill part. Okay, so we've talked now about why AKI might be important, uh, how we can predict it, how we can potentially prevent it for those who are at risk, and then now we'll talk a little bit about actually detecting acute kidney injury. Obviously, the gold standard for detecting acute kidney injury is serum creatinine. Uh, and serum creatinine tends to peak at around two days after surgery. Uh, and just using serum creatinine, as you saw in the epidemiology part, you'll detect somewhere in the order of uh, uh, 10 to 15% of patients who will have a substantive rise in serum creatinine. So are there other ways that we can do this better? Well, about a decade of research really went into looking at other biomarkers. And I've just shown um, one of the more prominent studies here, the Tribe AKI study that was led out of Yale, that looked at about 1,500 patients undergoing cardiac surgery who had serial measurements of several biomarkers. In particular, there were um, urinary IL-18, urinary NGAL, and plasma NGAL. And they use these to um, try and determine whether or not early measurements of urine or plasma biomarkers would predict uh, larger, large rises in creatinine uh, a few days later. So whether or not they could do this better than just preoperative prediction. And indeed, it did look like urine IL-18 and plasma NGAL uh, improved clinical prediction models um, substantially. But what they didn't do is they didn't actually discriminate between patients who were likely to go on to rises in creatinine at day two and three any better than an early rise in creatinine did. And so they didn't perform really any better than uh, serum creatinine alone, as long as you looked at a relatively small change in serum creatinine at a relatively early time point. And so so for the most part, these uh, biomarkers have made much of an entry into uh, mainstream clinical medicine. And the same can be said of KIM-1, which was probably the, the third most interesting marker at the time. And there's been a real decrease in the production of research around these biomarkers in general, although there was about 30 other biomarkers that were proposed and being studied at around the same time as these. None of them have turned out to be all that promising. The one exception might be TIMP2 with uh, IGFBP7. Um, so this has now been um, patented as something called NephroCare as a, uh, a combination point of care uh, test. And so these two biomarkers in combination uh, look to have a substantially better uh, performance. So in terms of discrimination, they get an area under the curve of 0.857. And that compares to most studies of other biomarkers, including creatinine, that get area under the receiver operating curves of about 0 0.7, 0 0.75, somewhere in there. So it looks substantially bigger. One of the issues though with um, this assay or this pair of assays is that their performance seems to degrade fairly quickly over time. So it's useful when you know when the injury uh, is likely to have happened so that you can time the, the test and get a reasonable idea 
of whether or not people are likely to go on to progress to have acute kidney injury, but less so later. And you can see that here, where if you measure it where you know that it's four hours from the, uh, the time of injury, it has an area under the curve on average of about 0.75. And if you take uh, a time that's 12 hours out, it's about 0.48. Um, this is a slightly different set of studies than those that gave the uh, meta-analytic um, uh, area under the curve of 0.85 in the, the previous slide. So perhaps one of the interesting things about Nephrocheck, though, is, is that it's starting to be used in some clinical trials to see whether or not it can guide care. And here we really start to see the confluence of predicting um, who might get serious acute kidney injury, along with using things that are getting closer to um, uh, uh, goal-provided uh, care. So this was the uh, PREV-AKI um, trial. It randomized uh, 276 patients in a single center in Germany. And the way in which it selected patients was it took most patients who were undergoing cardiac surgery and it screened them with Nephrocheck. And if they had a uh, TIMP2 IGF-PP7 of greater than 0.3, they were eligible because they were at high risk for developing AKI. And so once those high-risk patients were enrolled, they were randomized to either go into a group in which they uh, had a conscientious kind of KDIGO care bundle, which included discontinuation of nephrotoxins, uh, holding the ACE inhibitors, and importantly, optimizing volume and perfusion pressures using a, um, a special enhanced monitor called the PICO. And they would have their creatinine monitored uh, and urine output. They avoided hyperglycemia and they would avoid radio contrast. The control group, on the other hand, was just usual care, which was still um, typically having their creatinine measured and their urine output measured, but they may or may not hold the ACE inhibitors, and they wouldn't use any special monitoring in order to try and optimize volume and perfusion pressures. And that trial led to actually a remarkable reduction in even um, stage 2-3 um, AKI with a very significant p-value and an almost 20% reduction. You'll notice that the overall rates of AKI here are very, very high at 72% uh, in the control group. And that should be a function of the, um, uh, the selection of patients with the, uh, the high nephrocheck uh, uh, ratios at the beginning. Now, I should mention that this trial has not been replicated in other groups. In fact, the only other trial that I know of that has tried uh, was not able to replicate the results, although it was a very small trial, and so it was likely underpowered. Um, but other interventions that have come out of this same center in Germany have also not been replicatable, although they all seem to have worked here. And that includes things like um, the remote ischemic preconditioning, which was successful in this group, but really largely unsuccessful in all larger trials that were done in, uh, in other centers. Um, and they, they also are the, one of the few trials that had very positive results for um, early initiation dialysis. Uh, so I would take this kind of result with a green, or sorry, this kind of result um, with caution as to whether or not it really represents an improvement in care. Uh, but I think it's uh, very interesting and should lead to uh, further trials. Okay, so the last little bit that I want to talk about is just about treating acute kidney injury once we know what's happened. So once we detect the rise in creatinine, um, what can we do about it? Uh, and the honest answer is there isn't a lot. So there's nothing really to talk about in terms of pharmacologic therapies. Uh, there are no pills. And again, I think that very much gets back to the idea that this is an ischemic reperfusion injury that occurs. And most of what we need to do is probably turn off the ischemic injury and then carefully monitor people for the complications of the ischemic injury that they, uh, they suffered. So what then is probably why it has um, been of such interest to do things like enhanced monitoring. Um, and e-alerts has been uh, for acute kidney injury has been really one of the, uh, the sort of poster children of the ways in which we use um, hospital informatic systems in more complicated and interesting ways. And so these e-alerts essentially uh, tie into the biochemistry departments of hospitals. And every time a creatinine starts to rise, they have a way of contacting the responsible clinicians and or 
contacting the nephrologists in order to tell them that this patient has this change in their serum creatinine that indicates uh, acute kidney injury and that something should be done about it. Um, there is several studies that were done. I've chosen this one in particular because it's a fairly large uh, cluster uh, um, stepped wedge trial that was done in the UK where the e-alert system has been now become part of the national um, quality assurance uh, program. And so what they did is they measured the rates of AKI progression and mortality and uh, um, uh, the ways in which AKI was managed prior to implementing this electronic automatic trigger that would tell their clinicians to go through a process of um, looking at the fluids and uh, the volume status medications and testing that was being done on patients who had creatinines that were elevated. And I should mention that those e-alerts don't tell people to measure creatinines, they only react to the creatinines that were already measured. Um, and so the, it doesn't tell you how much AKI you were missing, it only tells you that you should deal with the AKI that you've already detected because you thought enough to actually measure a creatinine in the first place. Now when they did this, they didn't find any difference in mortality, and honestly I don't think that's very surprising because the overall contribution of AKI to mortality uh, in the hospital is relatively low. And this is not restricted to surgery, but a large number of these patients would have been surgical patients as well. Um, they also didn't see any difference in AKI progression, meaning that the rate of, uh, of rise of creatinine or the, the total um, stage of creatinine that people got to didn't really change after the intervention. What they did notice that for those with AKI, there was a shorter length of stay, and they noticed that the incidence of AKI was increased. And I would suggest that that means that in fact, as the, the prompt was rolled out, clinicians were likely to become more attuned to the fact that AKI occurs, and they're likely to order more creatinines in general, not just in the, uh, the patients who are already getting them. And so they detected more AKI, but it was less serious AKI which would explain why the length of stay for patients with AKI was shorter. It's because now the, uh, the overall population was diluted with a less ill set of patients. In terms of processes, they did note that when they sent out these e-alerts, uh, there was an increased number of assessments of um, the fluid status and the medications received by patients uh, who had AKI, and there was more urinalyses performed. It does not say, and they can't tell from their data, whether or not that means that it was more appropriate care or whether or not changes were made that actually were likely to help. Uh, and I have a tough time understanding uh, for many of the hospitalized patients whether or not urinalyses performed after the AKI sets in really would have helped, um, certainly not in the, uh, the surgical patients. Uh, but this kind of the, the issue that we actually don't have great treatments um, for many of the causes of AKI may make the e-alerts relatively um, small effects. The last little thing that I wanted to talk about then was just early versus late dialysis, partly because um, this has always been a very hot topic and it's often uh, when the nephrologists in our hospital at least become most involved uh, with acute kidney injury. Um, and it's very timely because the START AKI trial was just published uh, the other week in the New England Journal of Medicine. And of course, I'm excessively proud of it because uh, several of my, my good colleagues here in Canada are the ones who started the trial. So they randomized uh, 3,019 patients uh, who were admitted to the ICU. About 1,000 of those patients were post-operative ICU admissions. Um, so a reasonably large number. Uh, all of those patients uh, who were potentially eligible had doubling of creatinine um, and had to have at least abnormal creatinine levels. So you couldn't go from uh, creatinine of 45 micromolar to 90 micromolar. Uh, you had to actually go above 100 for females and above 130 for men. And uh, those individuals were then randomized to either start dialysis within 12 hours or when it was clinically indicated. And in order to get in as well, before randomization, clinicians had to agree that you would not absolutely need dialysis within the next day, or you absolutely would never need dialysis. 
So there had to be a degree of equipoise prior to patients being randomized about whether or not dialysis would really be needed. When they did this, very similar to actually their pilot trial, uh, over a third of patients who were in the standard arm, so just starting when clinically indicated, never required dialysis. They never had an indication where someone felt like they really needed to start dialysis. Whereas 97% of the accelerated arm received their dialysis within 12 hours. The rates of death were essentially identical in both groups, but importantly, dialysis dependence was earlier in the, uh, or was, uh, sorry, uh, larger in the accelerated group. So if you started dialysis earlier, there was a, a 1.7 fold increase in the risk of remaining dialysis dependent at 90 days compared to those who started with the standard indication. And I think that gets back to um, the very, one of the very first points I made is that uh, in fluids, our goal is to give the, uh, the, the right amount and not too much, not too little. With dialysis, it's probably a very similar philosophy. We should give it when it's needed, and we probably shouldn't do it when it's not needed. Um, the trick is trying to figure out when it's actually needed without waiting too long. And again, this is also probably not that surprising um, in that the role after AKI has started is really to turn off the initiating issue, which is typically some kind of ischemic reperfusion injury, and then to monitor for complications. Uh, and that is exactly what a, a standard um, start to dialysis does. So with that, a few conclusions. So AKI is clearly really strongly associated with developing chronic kidney disease and mortality, but so far strategies to prevent AKI have not, even the successful strategies preventing AKI have not demonstrated any kind of longer term benefit or a reduction in mortality. Some of that is an issue of power, but some of that may actually just be that um, much of the AKI that we see as rises in creatinine is not all that important. And so reducing it may not result, may not be expected to result in anything clinically important. Regardless, the need for dialysis after surgery is uh, clearly important. And I think it's important that we remember when we're uh, talking to patients about what happens to them once they require dialysis is that 40% uh, will likely not leave the hospital alive. And of those who do survive, the 25% uh, are likely to remain on permanent dialysis. Um, risk prediction, well established for cardiac surgery, which allows us to really talk about uh, the, the consequences of cardiac surgery in an informed way, uh, but we don't have that same kind of um, ability in non-cardiac surgery yet. Uh, preventative strategies uh, with preconditioning, goal-directed care are all very interesting. The inconsistency in the data uh, is somewhat um, concerning, and the fact that most of these studies don't have large pivotal RCTs to support them, where we think that the evidence is so clear-cut that uh, we no longer have to rely on meta-analyses of many small trials is still missing. Early detection looks like it's a good way of helping. Uh, it's not clear that it's any better detecting early, though, with uh, biomarkers than it is with uh, routine creatinine, and, uh, but they do present a new strategy to incorporate into care. And volume management and ensuring good perfusion, uh, as well as discontinuing nephrotoxins, is likely a good idea no matter what, um, but especially after early AKI has been detected, because it's already told you that the ischemic injury has had an end organ effect. With that, again, I'd like to just say thank you again to the organizers, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael Walsh. Um, that was a very uh, interesting and complete lecture. Um, Post-surgical AKI or perioperative acute kidney injury is one topic that is actually contained in one textbook. And we appreciate it a lot that you were able to manage to talk about it in about 30 to 40 minutes. And I think we have a lot of questions um, from our attendees. Um, the first question actually, uh, I have a request here, Professor, if you could turn on your camera during this Q&A, if you don't mind. All right, but I'll warn you, I'm uh, in full COVID mode and I'm post-call, so I'm sitting in my... <laughs> we'll be interested to look at you. Okay. Uh, you could... Okay. Perfect. All right, so I'll read the first question. Um, you mentioned this a while ago that biomarkers may have a 
an important role in predicting the uh, high risk level of somebody who would develop acute kidney injury. Uh, you mentioned about tissue uh, MP or tissue metalloproteinase, but it's not actually available in the Philippines. What we have here is um, urine engal and cystatin C. We had uh, information on these two uh, uh, biomarkers in terms of uh, predicting post-operative acute kidney injury. Yeah, so urinary NGAL really doesn't outperform small rises in serum creatinine. Um, and so there's probably not a huge role for it. Uh, not unexpectedly, it is, uh, it is a um, tubular injury marker. And so it does provide something slightly different than the filtration markers. Um, but in terms of uh, figuring out whether or not the patient in front of you is more likely to have a really large rise in creatinine or require dialysis, it probably doesn't do any better than a 50% rise in serum creatinine uh, the day after surgery or the day after um, uh, becoming ill. Um, cystatin C is interesting. So it's actually not as well studied. The uh, performance of it looks like it's similar to uh, serum creatinine. Uh, but intriguingly, it may just be some of the studies which are too small still to be able to determine whether or not it has better discrimination. Uh, certainly the more recent work in chronic kidney disease suggesting that uh, particularly in patients who are near the top end of um, uh, estimated GFR going, uh, or, or, or sorry, will have better risk prediction using cystatin C than using serum creatinine is intriguing and we have some data now that should be coming out on it uh, hopefully over the next year or so. Okay, that, that would be very interesting. Okay, speaking of biomarkers, uh, you also talk about risk prediction scoring. Have you, what is your experience of combining the risk prediction scoring and the presence of biomarkers in terms of your predicting post-operative AKI and in terms of improving your management, in terms of preventing it? Yeah, um, so interestingly, there isn't a lot of, of really good studies uh, looking at the incremental benefits of newer things like NephroCheck. So they mostly look at improvement in discrimination. Uh, and I would suggest that actually improved discrimination is a very low bar to set for whether or not there's clinical utility in most of these tests. Uh, what we're really interested in is better calibration. Does it actually tell us which what the risk is for an individual, not just whether or not they're at higher or lower risk, but what is the actual risk. Um, in studies where we've looked at calibration, where we've added preoperative uh, characteristics to intraoperative characteristics and early postoperative characteristics, most of the um, of the risk is actually conveyed in the preoperative characteristics and the understanding of what the surgery is. The incremental benefit of intraoperative hypotension, uh, intraoperative bleeding, although they are themselves really interesting as therapeutic targets and they come out as significant predictors, they actually don't add a whole lot to the, our ability to tell who's likely to get acute kidney injury. The same happened with um, NGAL and IL-18, is that although they, they added to the overall picture, they were no better than serum creatinine at 24 hours in terms of predicting who would go on to have more serious acute kidney injury over the next 72 hours. So uh, right now you're saying it's more of the scoring system. In your case, you're using the Cleveland uh, scoring system, am I right? Yeah, so we tend to just base it uh, almost solely off of what, what type of surgery they're undergoing and what their preoperative kidney function is like. And that's so really risk, risk the, factor assessment prior to the surgery. Yeah. And that's really used to ensure that they have a monitoring strategy in place um, in the post operative period. Okay. Before we, uh, we leave the subject of biomarker, there are some authors that would say a biomarker intraoperatively would be a better timing in terms of getting them rather than preoperatively. What can you say about that? Yeah, so the, um, I think it's always been considered the holy grail that we have a, an extremely early biomarker that happens within two hours. Uh, surgery has always been the best place to potentially look for it because the nature and timing of the injury is well, uh, well established. We know that we start measuring the onset of induction, there's a good chance we'll be able to actually catch when the uh, injury happens. Um, 
so far that hasn't played out that well. Uh, and it might just be that we actually don't have therapies yet. Um, you know, we, we like to compare it to myocardial infarction uh, and the use of troponins as being a way to have narrowed the, uh, the window to treatment by having faster reacting biomarkers. Uh, but in, in kidney injury, the difference is, is that we don't have um, PCI or, or uh, thrombolysis as an effective therapy to act on. So we're really still stuck with trying to optimize hemodynamics and we already we can measure hemodynamics faster than we can measure any serum-based biomarker. And so the the incremental benefit for hemodynamic management is not that great. Okay. There's a question here about the kind of fluids that we use. We all know from preventing medical AKI, we tend to use more of the balance solution. What about for preventing post-surgical acute kidney injury? What would be your better recommendation? Yeah, so um, the fluid type is almost uh, part religion now and part data. The, um, the, depending on which hospital I'm practicing in, the religion goes very heavily towards balanced fluids uh, or uh, albumin colloid. I think the one clear thing is, is that uh, pentastarches or uh, hydroxyethyl starches are generally discouraged now and probably have no role in hemodynamics. Um, and so I think that the, uh, the data around balanced crystalloid is reasonably compelling and is so unlikely to be a downside to using balanced crystalloid that we tend to use lactated ringers as our preference. We don't have access to other fancier um, balanced crystalloids like plasmalite and things where I work, and so we don't use those. Um, but we, we tend to use lactated ringers far more often than we do normal saline now. Yeah, it's the same here in the Philippines. Uh, our only access for a balanced solution is lactated ringers. So we could actually make some other close to it, but mostly for a practical reason, it's lactated ringers also. Okay, another question is, um, uh, do you think there will be higher risks for acute kidney, in uh, acute kidney injury in patients on SGL2 inhibitors who develop hypovolemia or blood loss intraoperatively, since in literature, it, it seems to suggest a uh, impairment of uh, tubuloglomerulo feedback. Quite a very intelligent question. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Um, you know, the empiric data hasn't suggested in the large trials that AKI is actually substantially more likely to occur. Of course, those patients uh, tend to be even amongst unhealthy diabetics, the relatively healthy ones that um, are less likely to have intercurrent illnesses. So it may just that they haven't been subjected to the, um, the appropriate types of stressors to show whether or not they have the predispos predisposition to AKI. I don't think it's at the point where we should be um, routinely discontinuing SGLT2 inhibitors in the period, period. but I think you could um, similarly argue that they may not have very little, or they would have very little benefit in the perioperative period anyways, and so discontinuing them is probably of no harm, it may be a benefit. Certainly, it, it took us a while, I think, to really understand just how uh, harmful uh, ACE inhibition around the time of surgery could be in terms of um, predisposition to hypotension and shock. And so the guidelines have really switched in the last 10 years to being much more routinely discontinuing uh, ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, on that basis. Yeah. We go to the, you mentioned you have your own study in the comparison of off-pump and on-pump uh, cabbage, um, cardiopulmonary bypass. So, um, the previous study by Lemmy actually had, had guidelines following them in terms of uh, preferring off-pump than off, uh, on-pump. And you said that in your own set of uh, patients, you seem to have noticed an increased risk for chronic kidney disease. Um, I noticed for Lamy, it's an off-pump, uh, off and they also have an increased risk for on pump for respiratory infections and um, uh, increase uh, risk for reperfusion. What about in your group of patients? Did you see those outcomes as well? So they're, they're the same studies. 
Uh, Andre Lamy is the uh, the cardiac surgeon who led coronary, which okay. is where the AKI study comes from. So, but you would so you would still recommend an an off pump rather than an on pump surgery. So, the the way that we phrased most of it was is that it uh, the well so the chronic kidney disease component came out about. Uh, a year and a half after the early results from coronary, which was when okay. the uh, the guidelines were first written, the, I think the chronic kidney disease component is is really people decided that that wasn't as important as the short term differences, but large largely in our center it really still seems to be up to a surgeon preference, which is still based off of whether or not there's a lot of aortic vascular calcification rather than whether or not there are other specific benefits um, to, to off-pump. It really seems to be left to the technical details of whether or not they feel they would have a uh, tough time with the cross-clamp. Correct. Um, the speaker before you, Dr. Arlene Gomez, would like to ask her question. Dr. Arlene? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Walsh. So I'm married to an anesthesiologist, and every time we have a debate regarding uh, kidney protection, and uh, I'm, I'm very much interested in this because uh, actually my question is, uh, can anesthetics really attenuate or prevent uh, ischemic reperfusion? And what are the mechanisms? How does the anesthetic technique influence patient's outcome. For example, after renal transplantation, um, because there is a reperfusion there. No? So can we also now repurpose this a type of anesthetics uh, as organ protective agents? Is it a direct effect or an indirect effect? Well, I wish I knew. Uh, it seems to be heavily debated without in, uh, a lot of progress being made as to whether or not it's a true effect or not. Um, as I said, the, the, the difference in the proportion of patients who have a rise in creatinine looks real. Uh, and the difference in the proportion of patients who have a rise in postoperative troponin looks real. Um, both of those things also looked real with ischemic reperfusion, uh, or sorry, ischemic preconditioning as well, but they didn't work out that well uh, in terms of the large trials. And so I don't know whether or not this is simply a hemodynamic effect, uh, whether or not it's actually a direct um, protective effect. Certainly many of the hypotheses uh, were centered around direct tissue protection, and there's a number of postulated ways in which it it may occur. Um, but I think what we really need is a large clinical trial to be able to determine whether or not it's more than just sort of stage one, two AKI uh, that is different between these, uh, these anesthetic um, strategies. I'd be interested to know whether or not you and your husband believe that it's a, it's a true effect or not. Well, I try to influence him sometimes on what anesthetic technique to use and I try to shy away from those that will have uh, so many effects on uh, for example blood pressure mm -hmm. but I think uh, it's really your monitoring which uh, will spell the difference if you think this patient is at risk then you monitor them closely and that's the reason why you're able to mitigate the AKI of these patients and not to have them go to full-blown uh, complications. So uh, we will continue to do that until we have all of this, but uh, it's written that uh, propofol, sibuflurane will be better compared to other agents. And so we are just uh, um, looking at the literature as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Professor Walsh, I still have a couple of more questions. Are you still good to go? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, one question was uh, from the very fresh study on uh, uh, standard versus accelerated renal replacement therapy. Um, there seems to be a lot of question, and I think this question may be answered by the supplement because it didn't come out in the New England Journal version. For the START AKI trial, does clinically indicated include 10% fluid overload regardless of doubling of serum creatinine? Are you privy to the 
because I wasn't able to get into the supplement copy of this study. And I, I would believe it's it's there. Sorry, the, uh, the audio broke up for a second. Could you repeat the question? Oh, okay. So the question was, um, the criteria, uh, one of the criteria for the START AKI was that clinically indicated. And uh, the question was, was the clinical indication for a START clinically indicated include more than 10% fluid overload regardless of doubling of serum creatinine? Uh, so are you talking about for the eligibility or for yes, the initial for, range? for those who were included to uh, to be included in the randomization. Yeah, so they, they had to have at least a doubling of creatinine and they had to end up over the, um, uh, the what was the normal range of serum creatinine. They did not have to be fluid overloaded. They could have been in their resuscitation. Yes, I think the rule there was there should be an equivocality in terms of, you know, whether the patient would need emergency or a delayed in dialysis. So there should be no obvious preference of an emergency or a delayed dialysis to be included in that. Exactly. Right? exactly. It was very much left up to clinician discretion as to whether Correct. they felt. Uh, and there was um, regionally there was some fairly large differences, as I recall about the proportion of patients who were, um, were being started on dialysis. So 60% overall in the standard arm, uh, but in some places that was quite a bit lower, in some places it was quite a bit higher. Yeah, but what's most um, stunning for me was the fact that a lot of them in, uh, in 90 days would have a renal replacement therapy dependent for those who dialyze early, which just mm -hmm. gives us an idea that, you know, deferment of dialysis for this group of patients post-surgical AKI would be a better rule than you know dialyzing them earlier. Yeah I think um, uh, as a general rule of thumb extracorporeal therapies are not good for people and if you can get by without them you probably should try and get by without them. Okay so this is a uh, um, uh, a question that actually comes out most of the time. What about statins? Do they have role preoperatively or intraoperatively when given to prevent post-surgical acute kidney injury? Great question. I specifically avoided trying to answer that during the talk. <laughs> confused. Yes. Um, so the observational data is incredibly mixed. Um, we had many arguments in the, the perioperative trials um, groups about whether or not it was rational to think that the acute administration of statins uh, would actually make a difference. And certainly there was work by the Dutch group that suggested it did, but that work was later retracted as having been potentially fraudulent. And so then we ended up with a group of trials where there were, they were all very small um, and they, as you probably know, some were stopped early for potential harm it was unrealistic to think that it was actually due to the, the statin therapy. And so I think we're still in a position where we really don't know. Um, the evidence is too confusing, too mixed, and uh, there is no overall clear direction. Uh, so it is another area that really was looking for a large trial. And the, one of the ones that we were considering doing, but it got dropped in favor of, um, of uh, hemodynamic optimization instead for our most recent one. So the jury is out on the use of statins. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a very difficult one to answer, largely because statins are already in such widespread use that the randomization of patients to statins, or to statins specifically, um, becomes actually problematic. Yeah. I think you presented the study here about the KDGO bundle of care in preventing uh, post of AKI. So um, do you follow that in your practice? I think not at all. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, I think, you know, we consider most of the components of the, uh, the bundle care to be just part of good clinical practice anyways, but we don't have a prompting system to be able to remind us of what we're supposed to do. Um, and I, you know, I would consider it's probably more of an issue for our surgical teams that are rounding, um, but they, they seem to have a very, you know, reasonable threshold for consulting internal medicine as well exactly. anyways. Yeah, I, for, for the benefit of our trainees, uh, the KDGO bundle we're talking about is 
removing ACE inhibitors, adequate uh, resuscitation, establishment of a good blood pressure, maintaining a good glycemic control. So these are uh, removing nephrotoxic agents. And uh, I would agree with you because I think for this to materialize and to be followed, there should be a nephrologist on board already prior to any surgery, which obviously is not something that we can demand, although some evidence would say that a nephrologist on board would actually ensure prevention of post-surgical AKI. Yeah, and well, there's always the tension of, um, uh, of the number of surgical patients that we would actually be consulted on if it was all of them would potentially overwhelm our services as well. Uh, so we, we're, we're in some ways, we're happy to be consulted, but we're also happy not to be consulted on everyone. <laughs> okay, so these are two last questions. There are about two drugs that are uh, known to have uh, some controversial role in terms of acute kidney injury, like metformin. Should it be discontinued before surgery? Uh, we don't. Um, mm -hmm. the, so the issue really, you know, one of the major um, pathways to morbidity around surgery appears to be predisposing people to a hyperperfuse state. Um, and unfortunately, we're not great at predicting who that will happen to. But I think we are getting better at um, both detecting and managing hypoperfuse states and stopping drugs that predispose them to that ahead of time. And so the use of metformin is uh, not necessarily as big a problem as it might have been if we weren't being relatively cautious around protecting people from what would lead them to um, consequences of continuing metformin. Okay. Post-surgery, when do you usually resume your A's or ARBs? Typically, it's at the, around the 48-hour mark. Okay. Uh, that the, a number of uncomplicated ones will, uh, who are getting ready for discharge will just have it started at 24 hours in preparation for discharge as well. Okay. I, I think to say, we don't do a great job of remembering to always check their kidney function, though, after they've had it restarted. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I think this would be the last question. Uh, what is your view about uh, IV albumin and uh, preventing, I guess this is for preventing post-surgical acute kidney injury? Uh, so in the hospital that I work in, uh, it uh, subscribes heavily to the religion of IV albumin. I personally don't, uh, but in our hospital, we tend to use a lot of IV albumin um, as an adjunct to lactated ringers. Uh, the, uh, in my own practice, I typically don't. I use crystalloid almost exclusively um, and albumin only when I have a specific reason. Uh, can you, can you um, allow me for one more question? There's one more Absolutely. question that came up. Okay, what about proton pump inhibitors? There seems to be some literature suggesting um, increased incidence of acute kidney injury and most of our surgeons usually use this once they put their patient on NPO? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the, so the MANAGE trial was a two by two factorial of proton pump inhibitors um, versus no one versus placebo in patients who had had a myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery did not look like there was an increased risk of acute kidney injury um, in those who received proton pump inhibitors. Obviously, they're a slightly different group because those are ones who have had myocardial injury as well. Um, uh, we don't routinely stop it um, uh, because of a risk of acute kidney injury, in fact. Uh, but we're also trying to get away from routinely starting them for people who don't have an indication for proton pump inhibitors since then they seem to stay on them for life for no particular reason. Okay, I think that's the last of uh, the question. Thank you very much, Professor Michael Walsh, for this great lecture and this uh, great talk with you. Uh, we appreciate your lecture and we also appreciate the pictures that you shared with us. You made us wanna travel already. Unfortunately, it's not possible. But we'll, we'll certainly make this as one of our options next time we are now allowed to travel. Thank you very much. Thanks for hosting. So glad to have been able to talk with you all. Yes, we hope to have you here uh, in our future conventions in the country once it's all allowed. Thank oh, you. Thank hope. you so much and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye. Thank you. So there you have it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Walsh. And we also thank the attendees for, uh, uh, the, uh, for your attendance, especially all those who asked those very uh, uh, important questions. We just have uh, some few announcements. Uh, don't forget, uh, our next webinar would be uh, No Clinical Directions in the Management of Glomerulonephritis. It will be uh, a lecture by uh, our uh, present uh, chair of the scientific committee, Dr. Um, Russell Villanueva, who, by the way, we must congratulate for uh, uh, being awarded uh, the presidential award recently. Congratulations, Russell. And we also have Dr. Steph Andres doing the lecture for next week. And again, we would like to remind you to please uh, continue attending um, our uh, webinars because this is actually part of uh, your consideration in terms of your active membership to the society and uh, Dr. Birwar would like me to remind you that our uh, 50th commemorative watch for PSN is still available and you can still order by uh, um, through PSN office or through uh, uh, our secretary Rael. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, in behalf of the scientific committee, and Dr. Lynn Gomez and Professor Walsh, we thank you for your attendance and have a great evening and stay, uh, stay safe always. Good night.